earlier we talked about um, new gen learning being a, a really widely interdisciplinary group of faculty and of uh, graduate students. Um, and our upcoming group includes some students from departments where research on how people learn is not central to their uh, dissertation topic. Um, they come from physical and biological sciences, from engineering, from the arts. Um, and so when we were planning this flash talk uh, format, some of them wondered, well, what could, what, what could they talk about? It turned out not to be at all difficult um, to see the connections. And um, I'm one of the faculty working on the paper on um, the purpose for learning. And many of the uh, students from the other from the other disciplines outside of social sciences um, have brought in really important examples from their own <clears throat> their own teaching and research, having to do with how to help students find a purpose for learning. And they have been quite involved in writing the paper that we're writing about a uh, purpose for learning um, or learning with purpose. And um, they have added a tremendous amount. When we started this program this year, New Gen Learning, we weren't sure how any of this would work because it's, it's kind of not too common to have something as interdisciplinary as what we're doing. Um, and it's just been a pleasure to me to see how the conversation has, across disciplines, has sparked really important ideas. Um, and I just want to, acknowledge the importance of people, uh, grad students and faculty who are entering into the conversation from disciplines other than the ones that focus on research on learning itself. So with that as background, um, the next speaker is Joshua Smith. He's from the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. And his usual research is on kelp forest community and ecosystem ecology. Josh? Thank you, Barbara. Walk into any classroom and ask students why they are doing what they are doing. And all too often, students will respond with, I don't know. I have observed this age old pattern in my own teaching of undergraduate STEM courses at UCSC. My research with new gen learning seeks to understand the holistic process of learning with purpose to address the problem of helping students to learn with understanding. Together with the Learning With Purpose group, we are exploring the importance of culture, learning by helping, and collaboration for enhancing learning with purpose. We are writing an article on the importance of learning with purpose to support learners' success. A key concept is that purpose has nested levels of activity. At the level of activity, people are often wanting to assist their community. At the level of action, we can think of how people go about to help their community. For example, in a kelp forest ecology course, students might be developing a climate adaptation plan. At the level of operation, their purpose could be to work on a map that shows how kelp forests will change over time. Therefore, the activity of trying to help the community provides an overarching purpose for the climate change activity. These nested levels could then provide students with a purpose for learning about kelp in order to develop a climate adaptation plan that helps their community. These three levels of learning with purpose are useful for me designing my own research, and they are central to the paper that I am writing together with the Learning with Purpose group for helping other educators and researchers focus on the importance of learning with purpose, especially for students from underserved backgrounds. Thank you, Josh. Uh, the next speaker is Dustin Palea who's in from the department, excuse me, <clears throat> from the Department of Computational Media. And Dustin's research is on socio-technical systems and STEM education. Dustin? Hi, everyone. As a computer science graduate, one thing that I remember from many of my courses was a focus on teaching technical skills. And while this is certainly important, this way of teaching ignores the creative and real-world aspects of computer science and leaves many students wondering, how is this useful? How is this relevant to me? Prior research shows that students from underrepresented backgrounds engage best with STEM learning when there is a clear relation to how their efforts will make an impact on the real world, in particular to their communities. 
Over the past two years, our team has been running exploratory reading groups aimed at doing two things. One, introducing undergraduates to the ways in which computer science has this kind of real world impact. And two, fostering a relational and intimate learning community. Here's one quote to illustrate what we're seeing. All of the people in my group were studying computer science or had a background in computer science. I think they made me gain an interest in the AI concentration in cognitive science because before I was like, oh, I don't know, unsure of AI. But like, since they were talking about all these classes they were taking, it felt like they, I don't know, it was a community I liked being a part of. And this is just one quote of the many examples that we're seeing in our reading group program. Thank you, Dustin. Um, we have time now for a question for um, either Josh or Dustin. If there's not a question from others, I have a question for either of you about learning with purpose in your own learning and how being part of new gen learning might be playing a role in your own learning with purpose for kelp forests and AI engineering stuff. Being part of the new gen learning group has really made me think about what are not, not just learning with purpose, but what are some of the things from the entire group that I can extract and bring back um, to the biological sciences and within our department and in my own teaching. Um, and so in the case with learning with purpose, um, um, this group has really made me think about what are, how do students' backgrounds play into the way that they are learning? And importantly, um, how does that shape what their ultimate goal is and their ultimate trajectory? Um, and earlier we talked about um, a little bit about why students are um, you know, declaring a, a, a major and why are they choosing um, this department in ecology and evolutionary biology. And so um, that is certainly influenced by their background and, and I'm really interested in looking at how it, it um, affects their trajectory and where they're going. Um, and so um, with this article that we are writing with the Learning with Purpose group, um, our focus is on um, formal learning, but um, I'm also hoping to take some of the trends that emerge from our study and apply them to my own teaching. Thank you. Dustin, do you want to add anything? Yeah, sure. I think um, similar to what Josh said about, you know, in NGL, I've really started to consider students' backgrounds more. And I think before I was taking the approach of, you know, we're trying to help students and we're trying to see how they respond best to certain teaching practices. But one thing that I've really learned from NGL is the strengths-based approach, where why, why don't we think about how students from underrepresented backgrounds can actually benefit these learning environments. And that's something that I'm definitely going to take away and seeing how these students can actually be the ones helping others learn. Thank you so much. So let's move on to our next speaker, who is Alester Allen. He's in the Department of Chemistry, and his other research is on di disease detection via gold nano antennae. Did I pronounce that right? <laughs> Antenna, antennae. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Barbara. Uh, so hello, everyone. Uh, the purpose of my talk today is to give insight into the importance of community and learning. So currently in chemistry, we teach with a focus on the individual learner. Uh, thus, the learning exercises are often uh, abstract and isolated. Um, so there's research from Roth and Lee who wrote that cultural historical activity theory would help an instructor understand that they are a member of a historically situated educational community, which approaches science and mathemat mathematics education through the rigid application of high stakes examination and accountability procedures. So my work with new generation learning aims to uncover details about how our individualistic system adversely affects the education of black men. And what I plan to do uh, to uncover those details is to have conversations with previous and current members of the student group Black Men's Initiative, which provides student-led mentorship and learning in a communal context. So what I expect to learn from interviewing those student participants is how working together and having a shared sense of community elevated their purpose for learning 
resulting in greater success. Uh, so what I've learned from being a part of regeneration learning thus far is that the cultural historical backgrounds of our students are a strength for learning. Thank you, Lester. The next speaker is Ian Allen. He's in the Department of Economics and his uh, research is on inequi in inequities in public school funding. Great, thanks, Barbara. Uh, the implementation of remote learning in response to the COVID-19 crisis has resulted in much greater difficulties in offering student support and performing hands-on activities. Uh, we are invest interested in investigating if remote learning is having differential negative consequences for students of historically underserved backgrounds. Our data set includes demographic and academic data on students and outcomes for intro chemistry labs at UCSC for the last five years. The implementation of remote learning in spring 2020 provides a natural experiment with previous years acting as the control. Prior to the pandemic, labs consisted of performing experiments in pairs, collecting data, and analyzing results. With remote learning, students are now shown pictures of the professor performing the lab and then are asked to analyze the data that they have been given. We will focus our study on the effect of remote learning on the number of students who eventually go on to declare chemistry as their major. This outcome will provide an indicator of students' sense of belonging, efficacy, and desire to pursue chemistry as a career pathway. Uh, we expect to see that students from historically underserved backgrounds will respond more negatively to remote learning due to a less tangible connection to the experimental process, reduced support from their TAs, and lack of community among the other students. The findings will have significant applications for the decision to implement remote learning measures after the crisis has passed. Thanks, Ian. And our next speaker is Abram Stern. He's in the Department of Film and Digital Media and his uh, research is on cultural techniques of transparency and opacity. Hi, everyone. Um, in New Generation Learning's Space and Identity group, I've been learning a lot about campus counter spaces. Um, these are social spaces created by and for students from uh, underserved communities. In these counter spaces, students engage in critical discourse rooted in shared identities and experiences in the institution uh, that the institution that they're in has not otherwise facilitated. Um, so my research interest is in how the platforms of established digital counter spaces shape communication and how these online spaces differ in scope from those that meet face to face. Uh, in an online counter space organized around the hashtag site assista on Twitter and Instagram, a set of themed monthly chats by female, uh, black female scholars recognize and respond to each other's scholarship. In this case, the platform allows for a broader set of publicly accessible engagements that expand citational networks and reinforce social solidarity for underrepresented scholars, although less concerned with uh, emplaced issues and experiences at a campus level uh, as a face-to-face -face counter space would. Site Assista responds to broader questions of visibility through a network that spans institutional boundaries and brings together uh, both students and faculty into critical dialogue. Thank you, Abram. We have time for a question, maybe two, for this group of, of uh, grad students, uh, for Lester, Ian, and Abram. Uh, say, I, I have a quick question for Ian. Um, uh, and it's, um, Ian, you targeted those three um, sort of negative consequences or deterrents um, to remote learning, but you can imagine there's lots of positive ones as well, right? Convenience, the ability to access a university education without the financial burden of living in an expensive place. Um, and so I'm curious, with have you gone through and made a list of all the potential pros and cons that you then can explore to see which, which ones actually turn out to be positive that, that you would promote in a remote learning program, and then which ones are negative that you would try to ameliorate, right, or resolve? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the big, you know, challenges in designing this study is how to isolate, I mean, any of those effects, be them positive or negative. Um, given that like most of the outcomes that we have been looking at for the past five, for the data from the past five years, uh, you know, have to do with like grades for the class and that kind of stuff. And that's all going to be, you know, very much confounded by the fact that they're now being assessed online as well. So um, <laughs> I think, I, I think, you know, considering the both the positive and negatives will be important for the design. But I think, you know, one of the big challenges that we're going to run up against is how to isolate 
each of those effects individually, given that the only the only outcome that we felt that was going to be easily measurable and not not confounded by the fact that the assessments are going on online is is students that go on to declare chemistry. So that's <laughs> that's a really good point, and I I hadn't given it enough consideration, I think, but. Uh, um, I think that's going to be a big challenge in this study for sure. I have a quick question for Abram. Are you thinking of developing any counter spaces like the ones that you're researching? Mm, no, but I'm actually I'm really excited about some work that's happening at Fordham where they're using some um, kind of speculative design and participatory design processes to engage uh, like with existing counter spaces to have those students um, sort of imagine what kind of tools and spaces they they want and need and i think that's that differs from i mean i, I just downloaded something like 380 instagram posts and i'm looking at the metadata suddenly feeling like i have a very different relationship to this content um that feels kind of surveillant um and so for me like thinking about how some of these smaller spaces um could be developing their own tools is really exciting thank you so in this cluster, we have two more presentations. The next one is by Itzel Aceves Aswara. She's in the Department of Psychology, and her research is on children's collaboration across generations. Itzel? Hi. Collaboration is a strength for learning in many underserved communities. In our study, we examine family changes in collaboration across generations in a Mayan community. We wanted to know if a cultural strength such as collaboration could be, be getting diluted with globalization. We recently videotaped the 25 descendants of the Mayan families that Barbara Rogoff and colleagues visited 30 years ago. We used the same setup to see if families were as collaborative as the previous generation. In this video from 30 years ago, you can see how all three people are engaged together. <laughs> The baby of this video is the mother of this picture. Instead of everyone engaging together, she actually tries to prevent the older child from engaging with the group. We're currently analyzing the videotapes to see if families in 2020 are less collaborative than families 30 years ago. These results could help us understand if cultural strength such, a such as collaboration could be getting sidelined with greater participation in dominant society. Thank you, Itzel. The next uh, speaker is Andrew Dayton. He's in the Department of Psychology, and his research is on culture and human development. Uh, our research examines collaboration as a strength for learning, as well as describing ways that Cherokee communities organize to foster it. We focus on children's fluid collaboration, which is a kind of mutual embodiment often found among indigenous and indigenous heritage children throughout the Americas. We're observing pairs of Cherokee kids working together in a cooperative game. When, they, when they're engaged in fluid collaboration, it almost looks like they're waltzing uh, with a shared mutual focus and a pace that seems to be moving them both. Uh, we're looking at their collaboration at a micro scale in 25 millisecond segments, which is faster than human reaction time. By looking this closely at how they collaborate, the study will tell us how children actually manage their decision making from moment to moment. We expect to find that Cherokee children who collaborate with peers in fluid, harmonious synchrony will tend to be from families that report organizing for community events, such as going to the creek, in ways that are fluid, organic, and inclusive of multiple generations. These sophisticated ways of creating and organizing collaborative engagement have persisted in Cherokee communities for countless generations. In particular, Cherokee communities offer a harmony ethic. That is, we value harmonious relations in all of our interactions. We anticipate that our study will show that these community values seem to work at any time scale, from moment to moment interactions between children to community wide collaboration unfolding across generations continuously for a millennia. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Um, we have time for a question for Andy or for Itzel. For Andy and Itzel, both in both the presentations, there's a value on collaboration as an important strength for, strength for learning. 
and in itself, modern times seems to be sidelining that, um, that ability for fluid collaboration. And I'm just wondering if Andy has found that at all, and if not, if either of you could talk about the, what, what the, the reason might be. So I'll, I'll jump in first if I could itself, and then I'll, I'll leave to you. Um, first off, I have to say that I'm um, uh, not far along. I'm still in the piloting phase, so we're looking at pilot data for my study, whereas uh, uh, I think um, the other study is further along. Um, so I'll just give you my gut here so far. I found that when, um, when we pair the kids the right way, which is with our uh, instinct gap from uh, a great deal of time and detail interest paid in the ethnographic lead up to this point in the study. When we, when we pick the kids we expect to be from the families that we picked from, from that work, uh, I think they're pretty collaborative. But um, I'm not sure that how much we can control the context and the context matters a whole lot. And so we'll see what happens. In our case, uh, we are currently analyzing the videotapes. Um, I think we are going halfway through them. This is too preliminary, but these families are way less collaborative than we expected. However, it differs from the constellation of cultural practices that families participate. So it really depends on what type of activities they are involved, the history of the family, and uh, several other situations that they are immersed in. Um, but we are really interested to see what is going to happen with this cultural differences in families. Previous research has shown that uh, families, for example, who have more experience with Western schooling uh, happen to be less collaborative in school situations, uh, not as much as home. So we are interested in seeing what are the results from this Mayan community. If I could, if I might, uh, one last thing. So I think this kind of variation is indicative of something that I think the group would probably agree that causes a lot of our work. Um, there's no way to really find an essential, you know, an essential uh, archetype. Um, whole communities change. They change, you know, whole entire communities might be very similar to each other and very similar to other kinds of communities that are like this one. But the whole community itself is also, you know, subject to this kind of cyclical change. And so it, it makes sense that uh, a community would look different uh, 30, 20 years later. Yeah. Thank you. That, just adding that nuance to your studies is really interesting and makes me want to know what you're going to find mm -hmm. as you move forward. 